when we designed the program, we felt that we needed, as a concluding session, to try to go beyond the business, economic, political discussions that we have had over these two days and a half. And this wish of having a closing session on the fact that it has to be more than just business. It has to be business going beyond business so that government and business together find better way to push a country up, to move a country up. And we felt that it was very important to have this discussion at the end because it reflects, if you want, our philosophy at Aspen Institute India, at Smadja and Smadja, that the business of business is more than just business. That business has to be a very active player in the social evolution of a country, and especially in emerging market economies where so much needs to be done to make sure that whatever prosperity is achieved is an inclusive prosperity and not, as it has been too often the case over the last 25 years, an exclusive prosperity. And to try to give us some clues about this kind of approach, this kind of imperative that we need to keep in mind, I would like to tell you why we have selected the people on the stage. I don't think I need to introduce them because all of them have been speaking on different topics over the last two years and a half. But maybe what has not been emphasized enough is that each of them is personally involved or is leading corporations who have been very forceful in implementing this notion of corporate social responsibility. In a way, they have really put their money and their action and their energy where their mouth is. Ronnie Chine, I have mentioned, is involved in many, many philanthropic activities. He is involved in preserving cultural heritage in China. He is involved in helping bright young people acquire the education that would help them become good, productive citizens, business leaders, leaders in their society. Mr. Gopinath Pillay is the chairman of Gateway District Parks, and this Gateway District Parks in Singapore is very, very active in the domain of corporate responsibility. They are leading many, many initiatives with respect to young people, with respect to education, with respect to health care. And Mrs. Kanan Chelebi, the vice chairman of Chelebi Holdings, also represent a major corporation in Turkey where the notion of corporate social responsibility is not just a slogan to do well with press release, is not just something that you put in your annual report so that you look good, it is something that is really implemented on the ground in a very substantial, effective way. So, and then we will come, of course, to Montex Singh Aluvalia, uh, one of the, not only one of the top thinkers, but as you know better than I do, one of the key person in 
pu putting India more up the ladder uh, in terms of standards of living, in terms of economic growth. We will come to Monte Carlo Valia uh, later on. But what I would like to do is to start asking each of the three of you here who represent the business side, how do you see your role in really, as I said, doing more than just business, being more than just successful business leader? And what does this aspect of your, if I can put that word, of your mission, what does this aspect of your mission represents personally for you? In other terms, why are you doing it? Ronnie, why don't you start? Oh, no. Me? OK. <laughs> um, I was drafted only a, a couple of hours ago. Uh, first of all, I want to really congratulate uh, Klaus Major and Tarun Das, my two longtime friends, uh, for thinking up this idea uh, of the growth net. Uh, the, the world in the past that we grew up in is one of hub and, sp and, and spoke. Uh, but now that global uh, world order is changing uh, and the emerging economies is really uh, growing very fast and the interaction and the common challenges and issues that they face is something that somebody needs to discuss and I'm, I think it's very, very good of uh, Tarun and Claude to have thought of it. The only uh, disappointment I have for this last three days is just one. Allow me, Tarun and Claude. That is, the word growth net has not been used more. Uh, whether it is the right name or not, I don't know. But somehow a name has, uh, should be formulated uh, to describe uh, this, uh, the relationship between the emerging uh, or constellation uh, of growth economies. I think uh, that name ought to be, um, uh, to, uh, ought to be propagated. So uh, in, uh, what is the environment in which business people such as ourselves, the three of us here, uh, are facing today. We're facing a world which is, um, uh, there's a diffusion of power. In, in the international scene, in the old days, the United States, plus perhaps Soviet Union, basically dominates. And hence, the world is a lot simpler place. Depends on which side of the fence, doesn't matter. In, uh, India was, on one side and then switch to the other. China was in one side and then they decided to break off and never really got to the other. Whatever it is, uh, the diffusion of power is a fact that we have to live with. And as many people have said in the last two days, that government everywhere, whether it's democratic or non-democratic, is becoming perhaps more weak than ever. Governance will be a lot more difficult. And in that, overall environment. That, on the one hand, presents a lot of opportunities for private sectors, business people, such as ourselves, many of us in this room, can play and should play. Because who is there to do much of the work that the weak government, for various reasons, can no longer do? I'll give you one example. The Philippines, where you know, I, close to where I live, uh, because of the weakness uh, of the government, the NGOs is thriving, all kinds, new, uh, uh, creative, in a sense, wonderful. The sad thing, of course, is that a lot of things that government should be doing, they're not, nobody's doing. But the good thing is that the NGOs are picking it up. Now, NGOs can be started, like in China, which is really not really NGOs, is you know, started by the government. That is really causing uh, NGOs. But the real uh, NGOs ought to be really led by business people such as ourselves here. It takes money, let's face it. And where do you get the money? It's in the business community. And if the business community does not step up to the plate, nobody will. The government, sorry, Montag, the government will, will do what they, whatever they can. But there are many things that in this new day and age, the government cannot do. And hence, I think the private sector has a role to play that is perhaps more than ever before. So yesterday, uh, Ravi Chowdhury, I don't know if you're in the audience, uh, my old, longtime friend from Tata Sun, 
uh, we were talking, and he was surprised that in China today, the biggest, fastest growing industry is something that probably none of you will, will, will tell me if I were to ask you. And that is Chinese philanthropy. That is an area that is growing by leaps and bounds in the mainland of China that is truly amazing. Everybody in the, in the world, it seems, come to Hong Kong and, and knock on the door of six or eight of us, or maybe four or five of us, and I know how to say no very, very well. And I tell them, you're knocking on the wrong door. The whole world is knocking on our doors. I'm sure many of you in this audience in India or elsewhere have the same problem. But the, big, the new area is in the mainland of China. And I think that there will be a lot of new uh, activities, a lot of new NGOs or quasi-NGOs in the mainland of China that will rise up in the coming years that will do much uh, for the society. So I think that I, I better end here. Uh, after all, we in the business world are used to having to su survive. Unless in the government, unless, except every four years you're elected. Otherwise, we the businessmen have to survive every day. And hence, I think it has groomed a creativity uh, in the private sector that perhaps in most places cannot be matched by the public sector. And hence, I think that the proliferation of, uh, of uh, private sector-led uh, civil societies is something that I believe is going to be extraordinarily uh, vibrant in the coming years. Uh, money cannot solve all the problems. But without money, I can assure you, most of the problem cannot be solved. So at least the business community has the money that can, if we use our creativity as much as we use it in making money, then perhaps we can do a lot of good in the world. But that said, I am still very worried that because of the diffusion of power today, it's going to be a very, very messy world, uh, perhaps far more messy than you know, in the old days under the Cold War. Look at Arab Spring. Uh, is it to the better or is it to the worse? When you have one leader in Egypt gone, you have a plethora of, of, of parties. Uh, same thing in uh, uh, Libya and, and, and elsewhere. And so the messy situation is going to be with us for some time to come. And we business community cannot solve all the world's problems, but let us pick one or two or three and see if, what we can, see if we can do something good, at least for our community, if not for the international arena. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Mr. Pillay, from your perspective. <coughs> I'm not very sure how to start. Uh, maybe I will talk what I did yesterday, for instance, talk a little bit about the model in Singapore on charity, on the way one gives ourselves to. I think throughout the world, the bureaucrats look at businessmen with some suspicion. In fact, they work on the dictum that integrity varies inversely with entrepreneurship. So the more successful you are, the more suspicious they are about you. But that doesn't stop them to come to you to support various causes. In the Singapore uh, uh, scene, what a successful company gives or sets up, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, is appreciated but it is not valued in the same way that the head of that organization gives of his own time uh, in being involved in various things. And uh, some 10, 15 years ago, I came also as part of a Singapore trade delegation. And uh, we were asked, why is that so many of you sit on various boards, uh, which have nothing to, does not give you a director's fee because they can't afford it does not give you any sort of recognition, but it does a good piece of work. I myself used to be involved very deeply. I was for 10 years chairman of a cooperative supermarket. Today it has become the largest supermarket for the workers. Uh, so I still carry on being on a board of a hospital that is for step-down care, uh, because people who leave hospitals need long-term treatment, and they can't afford it they come to this hospital. So the, our idea of giving of ourselves, the corporate responsibility is one thing, but individual responsibility is much more. So the, what this does is to go back to my earlier statement about 
the bureaucrat's suspicion of the businessman gets reduced because he sees the businessman not only making money but giving of his own time and because for a corporate to give certain amount of money there's tax deduction there's this that it sort of doesn't have the same impact as a person of uh, a very busy person running a successful corporation giving of his time his weekends his holidays to actually either to go and uh, I, I, I know a young lawyer for instance she every weekend she goes to read for to a low income family for the children how to read stories and sort of thing we value that as being much more important than what a corporation gives to the society so that's that's what try, uh, sort of instills trust of the government in the business community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Shelevy, your turn. You. What does it mean for you? Why, get, why are you doing that? Thank you very much. Uh, I was very much uh, honored to be here, but after I heard what was the real reason you chose uh, me, uh, I think again because this is a different appreciation we might uh, never get from uh, the business life. Uh, I think in the business life, uh, as you very rightly said, if you are very long time in the same sector and same company, uh, it becomes uh, at the end part of your family and it means you are very much in line with uh, your workers your society in the same sector and uh, every uh, actually third party partner that we are working in. Uh, by chance actually uh, I will give very brief uh, uh, my situation. Uh, our company was uh, established by my father in 1958 and we were the first actually grant earning company in Turkey. So uh, we try to actually follow his vision because uh, for so many years in Turkey as well, uh, normally the aviation sector or many sectors was uh, run by the governmental uh, institutions, companies. And always uh, the private sector uh, was uh, taught that uh, they are the one who is stealing money from the government. They never thought that they are paying the tax. They are the one who is bringing the maybe income to the government. They always look the private sector as a uh, company, as I said, uh, earning just themselves. But of course, it changed a lot after the 70s, 80s in Turkey as well. So, uh, but still, of course, uh, when uh, you are uh, working with the governmental uh, people, some of them uh, still uh, doesn't understand very well how the actually cooperation can be done or must be done with the private sector. But uh, we, if we leave that part, uh, what I can tell you, uh, especially I think in our sector, because our business is very much human resource oriented business. Even aviation sector is very high technology sector because we are in the service business. We work with the human. So whenever actually you start any new business in the different cities of Turkey, you start to uh, bring actually your culture, your understanding to that city if they are not uh, actually having any outside uh, investor, even in Turkey, in some cities. <coughs> so you are totally, in a way, a strange uh, company, uh, how you uh, dress up your personnel, how you actually uh, train them, what type of education you can give them, not only for the business side, but also for the, uh, their family side, because Aviation sector, I think in everywhere, uh, maybe only few countries is an exception, there is no education uh, for aviation sector. 
generally you always uh, get your people from the market uh, maybe with few qualification after that you need to train them for your business but also aviation is very again uh, interesting uh, place especially if we are talking about uh, not airlines but the airports because this is the place for all countries I think is a gate for the country. There are of course borders for all countries, but the airports, the international airport of the country is a gate for the foreigners to enter the country. So what we always felt as a company uh, in Turkey while we were only in Turkey, we actually believe that we are just a public servant like the government companies because this is a normally government uh, situation to be able to provide these services to uh, the actually country. But they subcontract this business to us. So we are actually representing whole country on behalf of the governmental actually permission. So that's why uh, in Turkey uh, we were always uh, feeling whatever mistake we do actually we are uh, giving this uh, image to the foreigners who are entering to Turkey first time. But if our image and our service, our hospitality, because Turkish culture also very much with the link with hospitality, this is what we show uh, to the foreigners first time coming to Turkey. So these things actually uh, you have to give every uh, approach uh, you do uh, to your personnel as well because they are the one who is actually uh, creating these services uh, to the third parties so what we do of course we train them in Turkey for example for their languages because we are not that much lucky like India that most of the people speak English so we need to give them of course a language training even for the worker side because in our business again everything is done in English because this is the international language for aviation sector so uh, first of all some people who are actually uh, working in the company maybe they never had or they would never had any chance to touch with the English language they uh, start to learn some of it and they are of course uh, seeing all the international uh, standards uh, from our company but this standard is not only technical standards as I said we are actually uh, giving a service uh, to the passengers who are looking for their hospitality in the aviation sector not in the hotels uh, so uh, what I can tell you, uh, we have right now, uh, finally, a university which we actually founded, Civil Aviation University in Turkey. And uh, we had the cooperation with the governmental universities because in Turkey, uh, if you want to open just one subject uh, university, you cannot do it. So you have to be linked with the governmental universities. But we invested the building. We are providing the uh, actually uh, teachers. So uh, in Turkey at the moment, we are trying to target ourselves to have the best uh, civil aviation university actually in the world. Because uh, we believe this uh, civil aviation education opens the Turkish actually young generation the world because if you are able to train yourself in the aviation it means you can work anywhere in the world but first of all of course we need our own sources for Turkey then but they have a future for themselves if they want to move anywhere in the world they can because that actually license that they can get uh, will able to work uh, them, uh, to find a work uh, for them outside of Turkey. So whenever actually we decided, uh, for example, uh, to come to India, it was uh, also uh, one of uh, 
as a, one of the partner in the group, uh, my uh, perspective, of course, uh, to uh, decide to come to India and to try to make business in India, uh, uh, I think you don't need to be a genius to look that India is the big opportunity. But uh, for Turkish people, India was not very well known. And it was a little bit hesitating uh, situation because if you don't know the country very well and it is far away, of course it's not easy to decide to go and invest. And there were lots of, of course, different uh, stories about in the business life. Everything takes too long time and uh, things are developing so slowly. But by chance, uh, seven years ago, we were able to come and try one of the bidding in India. And uh, when I came here, uh, I always uh, had some interest as a, my personal interest, the Indian culture, but after we arrived here, uh, when we felt uh, actually human in India, we understood that we had so much common as a cultural vice, which is so much important for us because, as I said, uh, our business is human business. So when you go to any uh, different country, if you want to actually create something, it is more than business, you rightly said, because uh, at the end you have to really give them some technical, of course, uh, education. But at the same time, you have to give some quality aspects to their mind. So, uh, it, which means that quality aspects in the service business actually comes from the family culture how you actually clean yourself, how you serve to the third parties, how you give the hospitality, if you are a smiling person or if you are always so serious people. These are seems to be very personal things, but generally it really comes from the culture. That's why uh, when I saw India, I said we should definitely be here because we have been in Hungary before that, we have been in Georgia, we have been in actually Frankfurt, but those countries, they are more developed, seems to be, except of course Hungary, countries uh, in Europe, but uh, the working force uh, is quite different. For example, in Hungary, first time we thought that we will be very easily successful because it's a small business and it is a very, uh, not too high competition. But to convince the people in that uh, actually country, gave, uh, I think took us at least three years to understand each other, how we can motivate them. What we offer them to motivate to do the business the way we like to do. Because if you give them more money, they were not happy. If you uh, give them more uh, actually career, and uh, ask them to be a chief, to be a you know, manager, they don't want it. They said, no, I mean, I don't want to go higher, I don't want to uh, you know, uh, have more money, I am so happy with my existing situation, just don't change my planning. So we were shocked, I mean, we didn't know how to really deal with these people, how we can motivate them, but finally, of course, uh, we found our way and now we are very happy even in Hungary. But these are the things actually you really see in our business life. Uh, that's why you definitely uh, write uh, something if you are working for a long time, uh, you really need to think that what are you uh, uh, really uh, matching with their society, that, that with the culture. Especially, this is my last uh, comment, when you are privatizing a monopoly situation uh, from the governmental bodies, we know that very uh, openly because same thing happened in Turkey in many sectors, people generally resist and they say that we don't want to lose our job because if private companies come, they fire everybody, they work with the little uh, number of people, so we don't want any private sector. But it was a contrary situation, of course, because if you can grow the business, if you can bring the 
really efficiency and have more business, which means you have more people in the work. Maybe you have less people if you are staying with the same capacity. You, it's definitely right. Generally, governmental companies overloaded because of different social aspects. But you can have the same number or more number of people uh, in the uh, that uh, business when you are able to bring more business. Thank you. Thank you. Montek, let me, let me turn to you. As Ronnie, Ronnie Munch mentioned, government resources are limited everywhere. And for you, as a member of a government, in a way, when you are confronted in situations where your resources are scarce, where you see the needs immense, what, as a government leader, what, as a government people, do you wish to see business do to contribute more, to play their part in pushing the country up? Tough question. <clears throat> and, and in a way, if I may add, we speak about PPPs, public-private partnerships, always thinking about infrastructure projects or this kind of thing. But how can the notion of PPPs be extended way beyond the business realm to address the social aspects? Well, let me, uh, <clears throat> actually, before I address those specific questions, I just want to say how much I enjoyed listening to the three previous speakers, sort of giving a perspective uh, on the role of business from three different non-industrialized countries. I mean, Singapore is a developed country, but we kind of view it a little differently. And I particularly enjoyed Ms. Selibioglu's very nice remarks about feeling at home after you turned up in India. I, I really, I'm delighted that you're here. In fact, I'm looking forward to meeting a delegation of business people from Turkey. I've had a long association with Turkey at different times, you know, uh, when I was in the World Bank, my boss was uh, Attila Karas Manoglu, who went off to Turkey to became, become prime minister in those days. And much later, a very good friend, Kemal Dervis, who became your deputy prime minister. So I've been kind of wa watching, I mean, this notion of commonality. Uh, Turkey is, of course, a much richer country than India. But there's a sense in which uh, it's very useful to share experiences uh, between two countries, both of which are regarded as emerging markets. I just want to also comment, by the way, that I was struck by what you're saying, that Turkey is very different from India, where everybody speaks English. Everybody doesn't speak English in India. You know, Louis Mal uh, made a beautiful film in the 1970s, which began with a completely black screen, and then a face, and another face, and another face. It was on India, and all Indian faces and all of them were talking. And then there was Louis Mal's voice coming over the, screen, uh, the audio saying that only 2% of Indians speak English, but this group never stops talking. So you know, I, I, think, I think what is true is that the 2% may have become 10. But you know, that's still 120 million. So actually 120 million people sort of speaking English if you wanted to make a film in English, that's quite a significant market to aim at. So I think that's the difference in India. Now, uh, let, me, let me address these issues. I think it's, it's very complex, and I, I'm struck by many different thoughts. First of all, I think let us recognize that, you know, um, capitalism in the last few years has appeared to be under threat in the industrialized countries. I mean, there's a big, it's not just uh, post Lehman Brothers. You know, the questioning about uh, whether the system was actually competitive and therefore fair uh, had happened, had begun to be raised even earlier. I think this group probably heard Raghuram Rajan. Uh, did Raghuram come and speak here? He didn't. Well, he's now the chief economist, uh, and Raghu, with the uh, Professor Zwingales had uh, written a very fine book, Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists. And this tension 
uh, is an interesting one. Uh, after the financial crisis, at least uh, in the industrialized countries, there's a huge pushback on issues of greed and this and that, and I don't have to go into it. Um, the interesting thing is that in the industrialized countries, I really don't think capitalism is under any threat at all because the institutions are actually very firm. And while these issues are being raised, I mean, it will stabilize and they'll learn a few things, etc. You know, in the emerging market countries, the conversion to capitalism is relatively recent. So a lot of this questioning, which uh, in Western countries is actually just redressing the balance, if you like, without in any sense causing any kind of a threat to the system, uh, in developing countries could lead to uh, a much more serious pushback. And I think business ought to be more aware of it and do something to create an ecosystem where it is perceived to be uh, actually contributing substantially, not just to business, but broadly creating a socially just society. So I think that issue uh, being put on the agenda is very important. Now, one, I think Ronnie mentioned this, uh, one very important part uh, of the whole thing is essentially the involvement of people uh, in the corporate sector uh, in philanthropy or non-profit making activity. Uh, I think we don't have enough of it uh, and we should have more of it. Hopefully it'll happen automatically, uh, but it needs to be done consciously. And I think Ronnie made the distinction between uh, individual philanthropy, which comes out of your own pocket, and corporate philanthropy, which actually comes out of corporate profits. And my feeling is both are actually quite important because uh, there's no doubt that individual philanthropy, I mean, in some sense should have the highest public applause. Uh, but, you know, even corporate uh, involvement in nonprofit activity, at least in our kind of countries, can help to create social capital. Uh, you know, we in the law, we've, we, we've recently, the, the bill that we've put uh, before Parliament, which is the amendment to the Companies Act, uh, makes a non-mandatory provision uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strongly suggestive but not actually mandatory provision that every corporation above a certain size or something should spend 2% uh, of its uh, profits in what are called, uh, in what is called corporate social responsibility. Uh, and if for some reason it can't do so, it should explain in the annual report why it's not done. Now, there's a lot of debate uh, on this. Some people said, look, what is this? I mean, why don't we just raise the corporate tax rate by 2% and then we'll spend the money for them. And, you know, you can argue from a certain point of view uh, that after all, the government is an elected government. They're the best able to judge what people need. But the other argument was that if the corporate sector is forced to spend 2% in corporate social responsibility, uh, that creates social capital. I mean, people sense that you're doing something which is not, you could have given away in dividend, but you didn't, and you could have tucked away in your profits, and you didn't, and you actually spent it doing something useful. And no doubt there'll be misuse and, and sort of uh, cases where it isn't actually doing something very useful. But, you know, competition and the desire to be seen to be publicly doing something good is bound to have a stabilizing impact. I think in our kind of societies, we need that a lot especially right now, because globally, I mean, if you want, if you want something anti uh, the private sector, uh, there's reams of this stuff coming out from the industrialized countries. Uh, so I think the, the private sector is emerging market countries should take some precautionary steps to protect themselves from this. And I think that's very useful. Um, you know, going beyond that, I mean, beyond the philanthropy side, which is actually more important than it might be thought. I think we need, in, uh, in India, I'm now talking about India because I don't know enough about other uh, countries. You know, we are very, we're still at a very early stage, uh, after all, of our development. I mean, per capita income of $1,600, $1,700. Uh, 
And maybe in the next 20 years, we will be able to take that up to 10,000, 12,000, something like that. Uh, by when, the, the system will have become much more stable and reinforced. But you know, it seems to me that in that process, the private sector should actually be contributing to the development of a national consensus on where do we want to go, what is a socially just society, what should the government be doing, and it should be participating in this in a manner where people listen. And it's not just lobbying to lower your own taxes. I mean, that's a legitimate activity. And I, I mean, I don't think the corporate sector needs my advice on how to lobby for things that improve their own balance sheet. But I think they do need advice on how to actually become actors in the formation of public opinion. And frankly, I think one of the most disappointing things is that the corporate sector in industrialized countries has actually abandoned this role. I mean, one of the most, I may have even said this yesterday, but you know, one of the very interesting things is that there are intense debates going on in the industrialized world. Let's take uh, US, uh, Europe, and Japan. We know that there are economic problems in each of these uh, countries of different types. I don't get a sense where does the corporate sector stand on the big issues that are currently occupying uh, the governments? I mean, I don't get a sense of, uh, even in the United States on the issue of the fiscal cliff, which is now looking more like a fiscal slope and not a fiscal cliff, you don't get a very clear message coming out from the corporate sector, which actually educate both the public and the political system. And certainly you don't get it on many other uh, air, air issues. Take Europe, I mean, um, is the recipe of fiscal austerity, which is currently actually driving government policy in the belief that that is what we need most before we can start a process of a revival, uh, what is the corporate sector's view on it? Because, you know, if you read the Financial Times, I mean, people are hugely conflicted. You've got some people saying, this is what you've got to do. That's the only way to get back up. You've got to have belt tightening, a bit of pain, etc. You've got other people saying, this is crazy. Now, there's a huge debate, therefore, going on in which the voice of the corporate sector, I think, I'm not knowledgeable on this, but I think is actually silent. Uh, it's almost as if the corporate sector thinks, well, this is the sort of thing that people who are paid to write in the Financial Times bother about, and maybe it's irrelevant for uh, parliaments. But we can carry on doing whatever we're doing. But if you look at Europe, and you look at the problems of the Eurozone, uh, it can't be the case that these are not matters that the private sector should be expressing a view on. And you know, frankly, if you were to go into any of these debates and look at the people who are actually participating in them, and ask each of them, uh, do you think you have the support of the corporate sector? I don't think they would know, because they haven't actually joined the debate at all. This is, I mean, this may be encouraging our corporate sector also to think, well, this has nothing to do with me. I mean, we're the business of business, so let this sort of stuff go on. I think that's actually a mistake, because I think we are engaged in building a society and building a system, and it's a new system, and it's a system where we are no longer looking only at the industrialized countries as the models. I mean, after all, the part of the world that's growing most rapidly is Asia. So for the first time, India's linkages, I mean, linkages with the West remain very strong because the West is, after all, the principal source of technology and a lot of source of capital. But people are also saying, well, look, the fast-growing parts of the world are not really in the West, it's in Asia. So in that environment, it becomes important, at least I think for the Indian corporate sector, to be giving not just government, but the public at large a very clear signal. Are we in favor of continuing with an open economy? Are we quite confident that we will, in fact, be able to compete? I think we will. But that message has to come out very loud and clear in, in the present position uh, from the corporate sector. And I don't believe, I mean, I, maybe some of our Indian corporate sectors here, so this is a prov provocation. There's no point being on a panel if you don't provoke people. 
So it's a provocation. Do you really believe that the corporate sector in India has given the government a very clear message on these issues? Uh, I think that message is less clear than it should be. So I think how to do that, I mean, maybe organizations I mean, like this forum will help to concretize ideas. But those are the kinds of things that I think are relevant to what you're discussing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, let me, to conclude, go back to the three of you. You have listened to what Montek was saying asking really for a greater involvement of the private sector in contributing to a national consensus. And I share your opinion, Montex, that this is not only a problem in emerging market countries. It is also a problem at the present moment in Europe and the United States where the preoccupation is more toward immediate aspect and day-to-day -day issues rather than where do we want to go uh, from here. So you have heard what Montek has said. And so once again, Matt, I want you maybe to keep that to two minutes each to react to Montek's point. So Ronnie, again, you start and we. Well, I am afraid to say, uh, Montek, that uh, everyone businessmen or businesswomen uh, to agree on a particular view on policy. However, I have seen again and again, both in developing economy as well as in developed economies, where one man who believes in cer certain things strong enough can help drive uh, public opinion. Uh, perhaps Michael Bloomberg is one such business leader before he became a, uh, a, 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 a government official, elected official. And so I think that I would encourage uh, some thoughtful private sector individual to get involved in public policies, either through the likes of uh, India, uh, Aspen Institute India, or uh, some other uh, local uh, career uh, issues Institute uh, or other uh, to push for certain things. For example, uh, just take one, uh, uh, sustainability as an issue. I think that one businessman can do a lot in that one area. <coughs> so I think instead of getting a consensus from the business community, because after all, business, businessmen are the most selfish <coughs> in one regard, and that's what makes them so powerful. And, and frankly, in the process, do good to society, huh? uh, creating jobs and uh, so, so on and so forth. Uh, but I think that it is far easier to think the other direction uh, and have some individual uh, business leaders that can break through in a particular area. Thank you. Mr. Pillay. Uh, <coughs> I agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Halawalia says about creating the corporate sector presenting a, a position on this thing. But I don't think it is that easy because as Ronnie rightly says, the corporate sector tends to be a very acquisitive animal. It makes money, it creates uh, wealth, but sharing of that wealth is not part of the culture. I think what we, and the other thing is, for emerging markets, I think we are too early in the game. We are new, the newly rich, and the newly rich are very seldom generous and very seldom conscious of its corporate responsibility. Over a period of time, I think the, the older uh, country, countries with longer history of having wealth, they tend to be much more generous. I think emerging uh, Asia, will eventually become generous. But what we can do to expedite the process is actually to create a culture of wanting to help, wanting to share, wanting to uh, sort of build up organizations. I think this cannot be done
just by the corporate uh, uh, sector. I think it has to be done from our, through our education system. Certain values have to be imparted so that a young man, a young boy, uh, when he leaves school, he goes to college, he goes to uh, work, he feels that if he earns $1,000, he should keep aside maybe $10 or $20 for something that will help society. Uh, I don't think we have reached a stage where that is done. There are countries that, that do make that attempt, but uh, uh, at the moment, the, the spread of wealth is so unequal, even in, in my own country. We, uh, I'm very sad to say, the difference, the gap between the, the highest paid and the lowest paid is the highest in Singapore, in the whole world. Our Gini coefficient is something like 0.42 or 43, which is one of the highest. We are not happy about it, but I'm just stating a fact. But we need to get this, there, there needs to be something done to try and bring uh, help for the people in the lower income, people with lesser opportunities, and so on. So I think it is a worthwhile aim, but it is going to be accomplished over a certain longer period. Thank you. Mrs. Cherubi. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, what I can tell you, uh, actually, uh, it is uh, very uh, rightly saying that uh, the government and the uh, private sector should be able to actually communicate with the uh, society and to develop the things together. Uh, of course, uh, as the gentleman very rightly said, generally the private sector or the business people, uh, they are focused on earning money. But if you are in the long term actually investing sector, uh, I don't think uh, the only uh, ego uh, for the uh, even business people uh, to make money. But uh, the problem uh, becomes uh, or conflict becomes between the uh, sometimes governments and the private sector on the different aspects because as uh, private companies or the business people, their main core area is money, but on the government side, they're actually uh, also uh, eager to have votes. So to gain the vote uh, from the public, Sometimes you don't want to do some uh, actually action because to develop uh, new things in the country, sometimes you need to have very uh, bitter uh, recipes. So to explain this to the society together with the government, I think it is very, uh, I think, best way. But uh, sometimes it is not possible because of the political, I think, uh, needs. That's why uh, what I can say uh, for the actually, uh, again, the social uh, approach in uh, different uh, part of the world, I think it is the same thing. A lot of actually um, institution right now or some of the references places or stock exchange market uh, uh, right now really uh, taking a criteria for the companies, what they are doing on the social uh, community. So they are ranking the companies uh, with these social activities, which is actually forcing the, uh, I think, private sector, even though if they think by themselves or not, which can be done, again, uh, maybe in the, some process of governmental uh, institution when they decide to do some business, uh, actually privatization or this type of opportunities they can offer to the private sector, they can still look for this type of actually uh, ranking uh, when they want to choose their uh, new uh, companies. Otherwise, I really don't believe also if government will force to spend 2% or if government cuts that 2% doesn't work uh, in a good way because all the governments, most of the countries, 
they need money for many things. So even, uh, for example, in Turkey, we had uh, some fund which was called uh, actually house funding to provide the people, you know, cheap uh, some uh, places. But those fund you never saw as a you know citizen because the uh, government needed that money for some other deficit. So it was collected but never used it. But it was meant to be. That's why definitely I think uh, private sector can be moved to this area with the different uh, references. And of course, education is very important because I think some social responsibility feelings should be coming also from the culture or society. So uh, I think uh, uh, what I can say uh, at the end, the government and the private sector should be able to work together but I think both sides should be ready and open to able to communicate. Thank you. Motek, anything you want to add? No, I think that's... Uh... Okay. <clears throat> so let me, to conclude this session, take one word or one sentence from each of you. Ronnie, you said, if business doesn't do it, somebody will do it. If, if, if business cannot do it, then nobody will do it. I think it was a very important element that business need to do things that no other category can do. Mr. Pillay, you mentioned something very important. Corporate responsibility is good, but individual responsibility and involvement is even better. Mr. Celebi, I think you pointed out to something very important. Of course, you need to treat your people well in terms of salaries and condi working conditions, etc. But as your Hungarian example showed, they expect more than that. And it is going into that more than that. Ladies and gentlemen, it is on this point that I would like to leave you. And I would like now to invite my dearest friend and partner, Tarun, to come and give us the concluding point, the concluding words. Thank you, Claude. I'm not going to keep you all along because it's late, but I'm happy that, uh, Kiran, you invited uh, some of your regular participants from Aspen India to be here for the last session, and I see many of them here. Uh, I'm delighted with this last session because for 46 years that I've worked with industry, I believe that, and I still believe, that business can do much more than business. And uh, in my own small way today, I keep striving for that. <clears throat> I have um, very brief points. First, to acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, Claude, the creator of this meeting. Uh, give him a big hand, please. No, no. Yes. You give, you give no, no, he is the creator of this meeting. And it's good to have him back. You know, in the 90s, Every year, on a Sunday afternoon, he would give us a presentation and assessment of the economic situation, which was a spellbinder. We will bring that back to you next year. He did something like that this Sunday, but it was not announced. Uh, we will formalize it in the future. And his team, Yael, his uh, partner and daughter, Barbara and Stefan, I can't see him, uh, great four people and uh, Kiran and her team who did all the work for GrowthNet. Uh, Ronnie, you're right. GrowthNet, GrowthNet, GrowthNet. We will hit it. Hit it big time. So that it's there year after year. Uh, thank you for that idea. First meeting, good beginning, I think. And we have agreed that uh, we will do it next year. And the dates that uh, the women in our team have decided are uh, 23rd to 25th March uh, in New Delhi. 2014, irrespective of the Indian elections. We are, we are asking the Prime Minister to hold the elections earlier so that we can have a new government by then. Off the record. <laughs> um, last points. We couldn't have done this without the help and support of our government. And I want to single out two people who helped us enormously in, in putting this together. 
One is sitting here, Dr. Monte Carlo Walia. And he has been with us twice, yesterday and today. He has been a supporter, an inspiration, a partner in this, all of this. And the second who you heard yesterday and met National Security Advisor, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon. Thank you all for being here. And uh, next year, for the overseas participants, bring one more delegate with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.